Welcome to our final lesson of the school year, and this lesson will be about the religious conflicts uh, that ended the Protestant Reformation. And so uh, it's important to know as much as the Reformation was about theology and worship, uh, it was also very much tied to politics and power. And so it ends in these huge, um, bloody conflicts that have a lasting consequence on people's view of religion and its role in politics and society. And so uh, the ultimate and tragic uh, religious war of the Reformation is the Thirty Years' War, which you read about uh, in your book assignment called the Thirty Years' War because it lasted 30 years. Know that it was not like a continuous 30 years of fighting, uh, but it kind of went in uh, phases. And that's what we'll talk about today. So let's talk about uh, leading up to the war. Uh, it's important to know that leading up to the war, um, there was a situation in the Holy Roman Empire. I remember uh, this was uh, what used to be part of the um, Central and Eastern, uh, particularly Central, though, parts of Charlemagne's empire uh, we, that we talked about in Quarter 2, Unit 2. And there were um, seven electors, uh, princes in this empire, that were responsible um, to choose the new emperor. And ever since the first round of religious warfare ended in 1555 with the Peace of Augsburg, there were four, I'm sorry, three um, Protestant electors and four Catholic electors. So three Protestant princes voted and four Catholic princes voted. And so you can imagine year after year, uh, well, they didn't vote every year, but whenever they voted, you'd have the tallies here, and they'd say, oh, uh, oops. Uh, the Catholics voted, and they uh, had four votes, and the Protestants voted, and they had three. The Catholics win, so the new emperor would be whoever the Catholics pick. So imagine if they were Democrats and Republicans, but one always had a slight majority. And that's how uh, peace was maintained. Um, here's a map of how it looked religiously here uh, in this line um, that you see in the middle of this brown line. This outlines the Holy Roman Empire. And you'll see again that most of the southern part and western part was predominantly Catholic. Uh, this green part in the south is Switzerland with the Reformed. And this northern part is um, the Netherlands, which was Reformed. And all this yellow and northern um in northern Germany, uh, what today is Germany, is Lutheran. Um, but um, much of it, the majority of it, was Catholic. Uh, there was also kind of a mix here uh, where it's brown between Catholics and different Protestants. And uh, just to kind of keep in mind, again, we've seen uh, different Protestant groups spread. So you have in this map um, this Lutheran block in northern Europe. You have... Church of England, the Anglican Church, the Reformed Churches in Scotland and the Netherlands and Switzerland, um, and then you have a Catholic majority. Uh, you have in these brown areas a mix, and so in Eastern Europe you have a mix of Catholic and Lutheran, and some Reformed. In Southern France you have the Huguenots um, and who were Reformed um, in uh, Catholic, and don't forget about the Ottoman Empire, the Muslims uh, Empire that uh, conquered the Byzantine Empire, and they were still right there on the fringe, and then you also have the Eastern Orthodox Church um, that uh, was surviving, although struggling uh, in Eastern Europe, and uh, but doing well in Russia. So, uh, this is what things were at in 1618, uh, but in 1618, something happened that started a huge uh, series of conflicts. And that thing uh, was, the event was that the Protestants in Bohemia, one of the um, provinces or kind of think of states of 
the Holy Roman Empire, they revolted against their Catholic king, Ferdinand II, and invited Frederick V, a Protestant elector, to be king. And so he'd get um, two votes. He would get one vote for... He would get... Oh, sorry. Uh, one vote for the place he was already king of, and then he also... Sorry, prince of, and then he'd also get a vote for Bohemia. And so now, all of a sudden, instead of having four Catholic votes and three Protestant votes, you would get only three Catholic votes and four Protestant votes next time the emperor would be chosen. So this was a big deal, of course, and the Catholics in the empire, including the emperor, were not going to let this stand. So in 1620, just two years later, Ferdinand and the Catholics pounced on Bohemia and sent Frederick into exile. So that could have been the end of it all, but it, uh, the conflict intensifies when diehard Catholics, fired up by their victory, send mercenaries to attack other Protestant regions in the Holy Roman Empire. So mercenaries are hired troops, and the emperor and other Catholic uh, princes, they hire these armies to go attack Lutherans and Reformed elsewhere in the Holy Roman Empire. So let's kind of make a, a list here of who's fighting. At first, it was just um, Holy Roman Empire Catholics. versus Holy Roman Empire Protestants. But now you have the mercenaries, and that gives the Catholics an advantage. So, who comes to the rescue um, is the Scandinavians, the uh, Lutherans in Denmark, Sweden, uh, Norway, they come in, uh, particularly Sweden, and join the German Holy Roman Empire Protestants. So now you have, what was right, Scandinavia. Um, sought to rescue the German Protestants, uh, which only increased the fighting. So now you have um, the mercenaries versus the Scandinavians. I believe England might have also tried to help out as they were Protestant. Uh, so this became like the ultimate all-hands-in religious war between Catholics and Protestants. Um, Spain then jumps in. Spain is uh, devoutly Catholic at this time, perhaps the least um, European country affected by the Reformation. And so they jump in with the Catholic side too. And just to note, uh, both Spain and the Holy Roman Empire were controlled by the same family, the Habsburg family. If you study the Renaissance and Reformation era, if you'll study in the history class, you'd study this family as they were very key to a lot of different events and movements. So now you have, oh, sorry, now you have Spain and the Holy Roman Empire Catholics and their mercenaries all teamed up against the Holy Roman Empire Protestants and the Scandinavians. Now France then jumps in, and interestingly France uh, is Catholic, but they support the Protestants. Again, as much as the Reformation was about Religion, it was also about politics and economy. And the reason they're doing this is because if you look at this map, um, France was right in between Spain, which also controlled kind of this region up here in the northwestern corner, what today is Belgium, and uh, the rest of the Holy Roman Empire. And so France did not want um, the Holy Roman Empire and the Spanish Habsburg um, they didn't want this family and these two allies to get stronger because they'd be stuck in the middle and be weak. 
And so they jump in, but they help the Protestants, even though their country is officially and dominantly Catholic. So again, this becomes a huge, huge, bloody conflict. Um, the first, like, all-European war. And again, their, their hope was of weakening the Habsburgs or we could say um, Spain and the Holy Roman Empire. And so by the end of this war, one out of three Germans were killed. And you remember, this is just after the time of the plague, too. And so this was just devastating to the German people, the German economy, and the status of the Holy Roman Empire as a whole, as so many were killed on both Catholic and Protestant sides in this war. This war had uh, lasting effects not only on the German people, who faced all this suffering, but also and Europe as a whole, which just saw so many killing each other in the name of God, in the name of Christianity, in the name of the church, no matter what church they were fighting for, Reform, Lutheran, uh, Catholic. Um, and when it finally ended in 1648 in the Treaty of Westphalia, much of what today is the modern yep, uh, sorry, the modern map of Europe, uh, was formed. So although the Holy Roman Empire was still in existence, it was divided into 300 provinces. So imagine if there are 300 states in America, not uh, 50, and the Holy Roman Empire is not big, as big as our country either. And so imagine all these small little uh, provinces and as was the case before this war, it was still that every prince of every province could pick what uh, religion uh, would be the official religion um, and only legal religion in that territory. So, and the prince of each province um, chose the religion for his land. So again, imagine in Rhode Island you had to be Baptist, and in Massachusetts you had to be Catholic, and in Connecticut you had to be Anglican, um, and so on. That's how this worked. And again, this was already this case before. In many ways this war was a waste because it brought the Holy Roman Empire back to right before uh, this war uh, with, if you remember, the Peace of Augsburg. So the exact same thing. And so all these people died, yet neither Protestantism or Catholicism spread. The only thing that spread was the death and the violence. Some uh, The Holy Roman Empire, though, was weakened. France did get its goal in some ways as a couple of uh, provinces became their own country. And so, uh, although it didn't happen right away, um, the Spanish Netherlands eventually becomes Belgium, and the Netherlands become their own country, the Netherlands. Um, so they gained independence from Spain. So the, the Netherlands did gain independence right away. Belgium, uh, I believe, was a little bit later. I, I'm not sure the exact date. Um, so they gained independence. And Belgium remained Catholic, uh, while the Netherlands um, became Presbyterian Reformed, or Reformed Presbyterian. So the Dutch Reformed Church. Switzerland also gained independence, and that too again became Reformed Presbyterian. which it already was, but now it could officially be so as its own country. So here's a map of um, 
Europe after the war. This doesn't have the religious colors on it, but it does show you um, the, co the country. So here's the Netherlands and the Spanish Netherlands, what became Belgium and the Netherlands. Uh, here is Switzerland, which is now a country, and some other areas became um, parts of other countries or, or their own country. And so, so if you look at a European map, you see small little countries. Um, some of them have to do uh, with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Unfortunately, this was not the only um, huge religious war in the middle of the 1600s. But in England, there was also um, a violent conflict, uh, which I call, I'm not sure the official name for it, but the Puritan Revolution. So if you recall, uh, the Puritans were Anglicans who had fled to the Netherlands um, during Mary's persecution. And while there became reformed um, and when they came back to England, they wanted to purify the Anglican Church from uh, all the Catholic stuff that it had kept. The Catholic traditions and worship and church government um, and so on. Finally, in the 1640s, after about 75 years of more peaceful attempts to change uh, the church to make it Reform Presbyterian, the Puritans, led by Oliver Cromwell, managed to take over the government, and they beheaded the king, and they enforced uh, Puritan, law, Puritan laws, such as honoring the Sabbath and having fun in moderation. So um, the Puritans, again, wanted only things in the Bible, and so um, I don't know if this was in England, or at least just in America, but they outlawed Christmas. Um, they um, wanted uh, more strict rules about the Sabbath. They wanted, again, their churches to be plain and simple and no organs and, um, and uh, stained glass windows, etc. They wanted it to be uh, what they saw as only things in the Bible. So imagine the change that happened once the Puritans became in power. Uh, became in power. In 1643, the um, so a couple years after they got control, the church, the parliament called for church leaders to gather and establish a national Puritan church. Again, this would be a reformed Presbyterian church that would be the official church of England. So the Anglican church would now be reformed Presbyterian, just like Switzerland and the Netherlands and Scotland. And when they gathered in the Westminster Cathedral, they created what's called the Westminster Confession and the Westminster Catechisms. Uh, and those are very important documents to Reformed Presbyterian Christians and churches to this day. Um, and so in uh, catechesis, they'll study the Westminster uh, Catechism often and memorize parts of it. And um, someone becoming a pastor in the reform and a reformed or Presbyterian church would definitely spend time studying these documents. But the Westminster documents, as as great as they were for reformed Presbyterians, um, they were not welcomed by the Congregationalists who would disagree with their church government um, and view of church and and state to some degrees. Uh, as well as the Baptists who would reject the view of baptism in the Westminster Confession. And so this led to division among the Puritans. And, of course, the people who wanted the Anglican Church to stay the way it was also didn't like this. And eventually, um, the, those who supported the crown, um, the monarchy, and those who supported the Anglican Church as it was, um, they... Um, Uh, they retook control of the government and the church in 1660. So again, this was a uh, long conflict, but it wasn't fighting straight through. It was fighting in the 1640s and then um, some years of peace, uh, but the conflicts returned. And finally, the Anglican church um, in its more moderate Protestant form and the English crown took over. Uh, Charles II 
became king in 1660, and the Puritans lost credibility. Um, people felt that the Puritans um, had been too strict um, in, well, when they had, sorry, first they had beheaded a monarch, which kind of makes them look sketchy um, in all their killing and even killing of the king. Um, they had beheaded the king and killed a lot of people. Um, they also had been too strict in their view of society and church. And uh, also others thought they were too lenient on heretical groups such as the Quakers. Um, so in the end, the Anglican Church um, outlawed Puritan preachers and professors. And so while well, for 75 years the Puritans had been kind of a movement within the Anglican Church, after the Puritan Revolution they are outlawed. You could not be a Puritan in England. And so, what do you think um, the Puritans did? Well, one, they left the Anglican Church if they were really serious about their views. Um, and joined separatist churches. Again, they would either become uh, Congregationalist, um, or they would become a Baptist, or now you have um, even English Presbyterians. And so the Puritans, after this point, um, sorry, <laughs> um, the Puritans become no more and are replaced by these other uh, other groups. So after 1660, Puritans no more, and either you join the Anglican Church and like it for what it is, or you leave and join one of these separatist churches. Mentioned here, Congregationalists, Baptists, Presbyterians. Many um, also left England because, if you recall, the separatist churches did not have equal rights. Um, the Anglican Church was sponsored by the government, so they had lots of money and influence and power, uh, while these others had to fend for themselves, sometimes faced um, legal discrimination um, and restrictions, and sometimes were even outlawed in various ways. Uh, and they had to fund all their own ministries and churches and whatnot. So uh, many of these left uh, for the British colonies, what becomes the United States, and landing in Plymouth in 1620, and spreading throughout Massachusetts and northern New England, uh, these Puritans left um, their mark in various ways. And that uh, ends... The Reformation, in many ways, uh, the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 and the Puritan, the end of the Puritan Revolution in 1660, uh, both bring a um, dreary end to the Reformation with lots of violence, with lots of conflict, and with lots of questions about the place of religion in society and in the government. And I wish we had more time. Uh, if we had a normal situation, we would have been able to see how the formation of America and the separation of church and state very much is affected by um, these events, as well as some others um, that happened in the Enlightenment era. Thank you.